4748. Joining us uh, in studio, journalist and author, Sarah Kinzior is here. Am I pronouncing your last name correctly? How are you? I'm good. How are you? Fine, just fine. Pleasure to have you here with us. You got a new book. Congratulations on the book. Thank you. The View from Flyover Country, ladies and gentlemen. Be sure to check it out. Available everywhere. So, for those who don't know, what is uh, what is is flyover country? Oh, that's a term that people on the coast sometimes use in a really pejorative way to describe basically everything between it. Um, I tried to invert it, you know, and talk about what life is actually like there because it's not a monolith. You know, we're demographically diverse, ideologically diverse. It's not just a bunch of you know Trump-loving retired factory workers who <laughs> you know uh, have a very conservative ideology, and you know that's the kind of image that often uh, coastal media outlets like to project. Yeah, you you're in St. Louis. Is yes, that, is that that's home? right. Is, yep. that, is, it, is it been your lifelong home? Is that where uh, you no, love? twelve years. Twelve years. Yeah. Um, you say Missouri or Missouri? Missouri. Uh, the, Missouri. Missouri is the South. They so. get people down there. So oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Suddenly right. it's Missouri, and you're drinking sweet tea, and you know the whole thing changes. So. <laughs> <laughs> it is a whole different. So that's interesting, because I, I'm afraid a lot of people do think of. Um, um, what you would call flyover country in in a certain stereotypical way. Mm -hmm. And and that's not the case at all. No, I mean, it's not. You know, the same way the coasts have their own stereotypes. Like New York City doesn't exemplify everything or like, you know, Donald Trump doesn't exemplify New York City. So I would hope that people would take the same, you know, generosity towards um, our region. It's a lot of different states, a lot of different cultures. You know, like St. Louis in itself has a zillion different subcultures. And it's an interesting part of the country, has an interesting history that I think tends to get played down or ignored. What what is the the state of of things? Speaking of cultures, what's the state of of um, relations, culture, atmosphere, vibe, really? Since um, in in the years now removed since the Michael Brown it's, shooting, it's tense and it's really? traumatizing. Um, you know, I mean, and it depends maybe what your perspective is on it. You know, for me, I was on the side of the protesters. Like I went out immediately, um, you know, to cover that. I ran from tear gas. Uh, My state senator was tear gas. My friends were tear gas, were unlawfully detained. And, you know, the hope from all that protest was that there would be some kind of substantial, meaningful structural reform, that laws would actually change, that people would face consequences, that people like Darren Wilson would face consequences for what they did. But instead, we've just had, you know, more black teenagers, black men getting killed by police, police walking away. We had protests in the fall over the same issues. It's it's incredibly frustrating. I think that awareness is up among white people because black people already knew, uh, but laws have not changed. And what we need is actual accountability for officials who, you know, in my mind, behave in an unlawful and often cruel manner. Um, uh, um, we are seeing, we just saw last night, it, it was a win, but it wasn't a win in Arizona, in Arizona 8th, uh, Hero Tipper Nini, who we had on the show, folks, um, came within six points mm-hmm. of a single digits in a district where Trump won in double digits. So that's somewhat of a claim of victory. That trend continues, obviously. Democrats are going to win back the House. For those in that flyover part of the country, Sarah, who did, in fact, support Trump, do, are you, do you see some of their minds beginning to change uh, uh, toward him? Yeah, definitely among the, those who were not that enthusiastic when they cast their vote. They kind of looked at it and they were like, I don't like either of them. You know, in my mind, obviously, there's an enormous difference. This is, you know, not yeah. a, a minor thing, but it's yeah. not how everybody felt. Right. Um, some were people who just always <laughs> voted Republicans. They were like, I guess I'll vote Republican for him, too. Mm-hmm. That is changing. In Missouri, you know, we had a special election in a district where Trump had won overwhelmingly, and that district went blue. Um, so it's part of this national trend, you know, you saw in right. Alabama and Virginia. Right. Um, you know, I don't know if the Democrats uh, will take the House. I think it's possible to take the Senate. Um, I think the most important thing is make sure everyone, making sure everyone has voting rights, that people are not disenfranchised, because you already saw that in 2016 because of the partial repeal of the VRA, that there are, you know, voter ID laws and right. other me- methods of suppression, as well as foreign interference from Russia, um, you know, and other interested parties. You covered the 2016 election as well. We talked a bit about flower country and its relationship to Trump. What about its relationship to, to Hillary? How was she viewed then versus how she's viewed now? Is there any 
I think it it depends how old you are, you know, what era you grew up with Hillary, how you're introduced to Hillary. I think the, you know, the media did not vet Trump properly. Um, They didn't vet (laughs) Bernie properly. And they obsessed about things with Hillary that, you know, ultimately turned out to be pretty trivial comparatively, like her emails or when she, you know, got pneumonia for a couple days, took antibiotics and it went away and it was like Hillary's dying. Like, um, I think that the people are left with a negative impression of her. Um, I, I think, you know, her strength is... The detail of her policy proposals, which is very wonkish, can be very boring. Um, you know, she didn't necessarily present herself with the most charisma, right. but she's obviously, you know, the most qualified. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, this is a campaign based on emotion. And I don't think that the kind of emotion that Hillary stirred up, uh, you know, was positive or rational. You know, you saw a lot of irrational kind of frothing at the mouth, Trump fans screaming, lock her up like that. That was the they still do the that. vibe of the 2016 election. So they, they, they still do that. Uh, do are is there an interest in, in your neck of the woods in Russia and collusion and Russian interference? Are people keen in on that yeah absolutely um i mean some of it might be self-selecting like people know me so they ask me about it but i've also Uh just you know encountered other people like people want to know what's going on it's a matter of corruption they want to know you know to whom is my president most loyal to which country Mm. this is a country the question we've never had to answer before i also think that the gop broadly is implicated because of campaign funding Mm. because of their own ties to russia you know you may have heard about my governor uh who has now been you know indicted on two felonies um He's wrapped up in the Russia interference scandal because of the people who backed him. You know, they were involved with Cambridge Analytica. Right. It's very intricate. It's very complex. I think it makes people's head hurt, you know, trying to figure out all the details. But, you know, yeah, of course they care. They care when there's that that kind of widespread corruption. This idea that, like, oh, out in Missouri, you know, people don't care about stuff like that. It's like we do care about keeping our officials accountable. Um, uh, even those, as you described, those who may not have been as enthusiastically for Trump, even they... I'll watch yeah, it closely. I mean, okay. you know, I'm not going to speak for, for everyone. Everyone's got their own view. But when I do talk to people, right. you know, sometimes I run into people who voted for Trump. Um, you know, they don't, doesn't mean they like the Democrats. It doesn't mean they're going to vote for the Democrats, but they're frustrated by what's going on with Trump. They feel like he's volatile. He's out of control. He's saying insane <laughs> stuff. He's not delivering on his promises. Right. And they're wondering at this point, what's going on with Russia? I think initially they thought this is just something, you know, the Democrats are saying they're mad because they lost. But when this amount of evidence piles up when basically everyone that Trump was in contact with is implicated in this Russian probe and there's been indictments. I think people do take that seriously. Uh, I think like everyone, they're trying to make sense of it because it is bizarre. It does feel like we're in some sort of horrible, hackneyed yeah. Tom Clancy novel. Right. So, you know, I, I have sympathy for people who don't grasp it all because I study it for a living and I have trouble, you know, keeping it all in my head at certain points because it's overwhelming. 8699 series Sarah Kinzer with us, folks. Her her new book, The View from Flyover Country, Dispatches from the Forgotten America. Uh, we encourage you all to check it out. It's available everywhere. Quick, quick calls, 866-99 series, 866-997-4748. And of course, folks, we're on our social streaming on our social media, Facebook, Twitter and YouTube, all make it plain. Uh, is there the same level of interest? We talk about Russia, but now there's this this side investigation sort of around Michael Cohen and the women and the Playboy. Is, is there an interest? There's in that? always interest when the president allegedly had sex with a porn star. I mean, like, you know, that's yeah. going to be across the board. I think initially people, um, you know, didn't take Stormy Daniels that seriously. Yeah. I yeah. actually thought when that first came out, I thought Trump must be thrilled because all of his other associations with women are sexual assault. Right, and this right, act right. seems to be voluntary. But then, of course, you know, you get into the nefarious aspects of it, all the threats, the NDAs, the blackmail. That's how Trump's inner circle has operated for you know 30 to 40 years it is such a typical pattern and i think it's great that stormy daniels came forward um you know and and brought that to light and that her lawyer has been such a fierce advocate on her behalf um you find it interesting he seems more nervous about that than Russia. Why do you think that is? Trump? Yeah. Uh, I think in part because of this pattern, because of Michael Cohen. You know, Michael Cohen yeah. is, you know, a lawyer in the sense, I mean, that like Roy <laughs> Cohen was a lawyer. He's like a, you know, he's a goon. He's a yeah. fixer. He's yeah. a guy who knows all of Trump's dirt, all of Trump's secrets. And unlike some of Trump's previous lawyers, like Cohen, you know, who are tough and who are, you know, sophisticated in a way, Michael Cohen, I think, is weak at heart. And I think mm. that Trump might realize this. He's very loyal. That's his appeal to Trump. But he has a lot 
lot of dirt. And if if Mueller, you know, gets to him, you know, Mueller has raided his house. Um, he probably has a lot of information. And I think that's the aspect that makes him nervous is that Trump has had this guy given out his NDAs for like two decades. So, you know, that's a disaster potentially yeah, yeah. if all that information comes forward. Right, right. And then the other guy he works with who pretends to be the other party's lawyer. Right. Which is really... I mean, that gets into some stuff that a whole lot of folk would go to jail behind that. I can't oh, pretend yeah. to be your lawyer working for somebody else. So I, I'm sure they're terrified of that. That's almost a, a racketeering. Mm-hmm. Um, in the book, you deal with, with issues from A to Z, including foreign policy. What's your take on the uh, the visit of the French president and all the stuff that went down? Yesterday, I, I missed some of that yesterday because I was out doing press. Sure I saw the. Yeah, because that's what you. Yeah, I saw we're on, that damn. Brenda, we're on video move. right now, so we got to. I was like, oh please, we're men <laughs> off each other in front of everybody. That's the, what you. Do. The French, yeah, the French. I mean, like, first of all, for, you know, Trump to be criticizing any man's appearance. It's like Macron must have been biting his tongue the entire very time, gracious, and you know, very was, yeah, very gracious. What you could know? he have picked off of Trump standing oh, right there? I wouldn't want to touch that. I'd be oh, let me get that bobby pin around from the back of your head. This whole net thing together. Macron's gonna have to get some guys. <laughs> in like a hazmat suit to like hose them down, you know? Right, right, right. But, um, you know, what they're actually doing in terms of Syria, I, I worry about it because I okay. worry about Bolton, who I think oh is psychotic yeah, and who is. I think is a warmonger. I worry about Trump, who I also think is a psychotic warmonger and who will use war, use strikes as an attempt to distract from domestic issues. Macron is not like that. I feel like he's probably trying to rein them in, that if they're going to go to Syria, like let it be uh, unified, let it be an international coalition of rational minded individuals um i don't know if that's exactly possible because the syria the serious situation is so tragic and so complex at this point because it's been going on for seven years that I, you know this is not a group I, I trust to make it better. Um, I hope at least they recognize the humanitarian aspect of it and you know begin letting in more refugees, begin letting in more aid, like at, at the very least. Which of course Trump won't even do that. Yeah, he won't so. do that. The 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 attack or the bombing. What was that? What was that about? Was that real? What, what was that all about? Which you, bombing in Syria? What, what Trump did? Um. In terms of when Trump it was struck Syria after yeah, the chemical yeah, attacks, yeah. I mean, we're not. He's it's like he does this every April, basically. The you know, both times he claims that he right. was moved um, by the terrible images of dead children in Syria after a chemical attack. And you know, Trump has no compassion. Trump has no conscience. And children have been dying in Syria, you know, since 2011. Like this is a humanitarian. Uh, catastrophe on a scale that the world really hasn't seen in generations. And so I'm very skeptical um, that that was the motivation. I think it it probably has more to do with Bolton. I think Bolton wants a war in Iran. I think that this seems like a justifiable pretext to get in the region because something should be done about Syria. Unfortunately, I don't think that that's their end goal. I don't think their goal is to help Syrian people. I think it's to get on in in the region and, you know, start up other conflicts. But as you alluded to, if you were really concerned about people in the region, you would let some of them into the country, allow them to seek the asylum yeah. that they need. And it's not even that he just doesn't let them in. He demonizes them. Yeah. He demonizes children. He thinks that, you know, Syrian children would inherently just grow up to be terrorists in America. I mean, it's an absolutely disgusting view of human life that, yeah. that he's expressed. We were sharing a, 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 an analyst in the Washington Post earlier was talking about all the touching Trump does and the dandruff and how that's, <laughs> you know, that's just basic uh, primate behavior. I'm the alpha a gorilla yes. or really alpha orangutan in his case um you know and i'm going to show you i'm the dominant and then i'm going to put you in this position and then see because it seemed to me like the, the french president was a little bit put off but he tried his best to be gracious right which i mean it may make him end up looking a little bit weak back home that he let this guy just kind of maneuver yeah. him i even think he was polite on the iran deal Right. Because we know he wants to keep it as it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, We had one of our foreign policy experts on the last hour who was saying, you know, if Trump leaves, it doesn't mean all these other partners are. They may very well stay with it. Right. And, you know, he's talking all that bluster. Well, we need to change it. It's a build on a weak foundation. It's not even that old enough to be on a weak foundation. It's, It's very recent deal. And Macron was being, I guess, very, you know, diplomatic and gracious, acting as if, well, maybe we can come up with something better. But. That's not what he really wants to do. 
No, I mean, I, I think he's trying to mitigate the kind of damage that Trump is going to do. And sometimes right. when Macron or other leaders suggest something, you know, the best way to get Trump to not do something is to recommend it to him and make sure everyone knows it's your idea. <laughs> right. So, and so I can easily right. see, you know, if Macron is like, you know, I think the U.S. should just stay in Syria. Trump being like, no, you know, I refuse. We will never do that. Or, you know, we're not bossed around. I hate this idea because maybe Macron doesn't want the U.S. there. Maybe they know that they would use this as a uh, you know, entree to Iran. I don't know. I mean, it may be much more simple than that. He may just be trying to form a you know unified coalition that's not acting uh, irrationally and with bloodlust, which is how Bolton will. He may just be trying to constrain them, but there's all sorts of, of variables at, at play. Big blow to him from the court on DACA uh, just last night. Oh, I didn't, I didn't oh, hear that. Oh, you missed that. So, so they've got 90 days to come up with a legal justification for rescinding DACA, pulling it back. And if they don't, it's going to stay in effect until that. But for the status quo, they've got to accept new applicants. Right. Court ruled that on last night. Oh, so that's well, a big good. victory good. for dreamers. Yeah, no, that's great because that's, you know, it's abhorrent what he's been doing. I mean, it's just one of those things. It's it's so heartless. It's so counter. It's counter to what America is supposed to stand for, but also just like such a punishment of people right. who've done absolutely nothing absolutely to nothing deserve wrong. it. Like that's one of those things when I see people getting behind that, um, you know, I expect Trump to behave this way. But when I see, you know, the rest of the Republican Party initially standing up for dreamers and then just buckling, you know, under Trump, um, as they've been doing, you know, ever since he got in there, they're right. so complacent, they're so complicit. Um, you know, it's really revolting. They've let so many people down um, for absolutely no reason. They don't even help themselves because Trump ultimately attacks them, too. So. Yeah, yeah, he does. He does. Uh, the view from flyover country dispatches from the Forgotten America. Is this your first book? Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is a big deal, folks. <laughs> want to support Sarah. Now, where can people regularly read your writing? Um, I write for the Globe and Mail, which is a Canadian right. newspaper, and for Fast Company, uh, which is a U.S. magazine, and sometimes for NBC News and you know other other places, whoever hits me up. So Come back and see us again next time you're in New York. Yes, You definitely. make it here much? Uh, sometimes. Usually like once or twice a year. Be sure to check us out again. Pleasure to see you. Yeah, Thank you for so coming nice back. To meet you. Uh, for all right, on. nice to meet you too, folks. Uh, that's it for today. We'll do it again tomorrow. If all minds are clear, it has been made plain.